uh, a diplomat uh, with the Australian Foreign Service, and she has worked with global multinationals like Visa, Digital Payments, with McKinsey, uh, etc. She um, has been associated with Gatehouse for a while. We've known her for, for a long time. And uh, I can't think of anybody better than Penny who understands Asia um, from her perch everywhere in the world uh, to discuss this issue with Mark today. So over to you, Penny. Manjit, thank you very much for that very generous introduction to both of us. And good evening, everyone, or from where I'm sitting, good evening. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I thought that this evening, where we might kick off is Mark asking you to talk a little bit about what motivated you to write Today Hong Kong, Tomorrow the World. Um, mm. I have recently finished reading it and it was deeply engaging, incredibly content rich, but thought provoking. So would you like to perhaps share a little bit for our audience what, what really was the spark for the book? Yeah, well, thanks very much, uh, Penny. Um, thank you, Manjeet. Uh, you're um, far too generous in your introduction. I, I had forgotten I was your boss. I think of us as colleagues. And I think you've, <laughs> given what you've done at, at Gateway House, you far outstripped me in your accomplishments. Um, and I do have to make a correction. My Mandarin is horrible. My Cantonese is worse. And my Korean is largely forgotten. But um, uh, I, I did... Um, uh, write this book um, out of a sense of uh, concern that that Hong Kong and and the the quest for democracy in Hong Kong, which um, has really been going on for decades, if not a century or more, uh, was misunderstood in the West, and that the the Beijing narrative, the communist Chinese narrative, was that Hong Kong was a business city, all people cared about was money, and that any sort of political um, Feelings were just some kind of plot by the British, uh, often um, in the minds of the Chinese, helped by the CIA to destabilize Hong Kong and thus to foment a, co a color revolution or some kind of uprising that would overthrow Beijing. I mean, this is and unfortunately is, is becoming the dominant narrative in Beijing's telling bunch of a bunch of misguided rioters. Uh, funded by the CIA now and and you know helped along by the poisonous Brits as, as they as they left their former colony and um, uh, of course India you've had your experience with British colonialism quite different from from Hong Kong's but Hong Kong was of course a British colony for 156 years it was right of course that that colonial period ended and uh, in fact it except for a historical accident it probably would have ended much earlier I mean uh, places like India, most other countries that became independent uh, won their independence uh, decades before Hong Kong did. But Hong Kong had this long colonial twilight where it was able to develop a, a real sense of freedom, not democracy, but civil liberties and freedom, rule of law, good governance, clean government, good administration, and real freedom to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. Uh, protests became part of the Hong Kong uh, culture. And uh, as a, I guess I'd say sort of a recovering journalist, uh, I've been particularly interested in the, the media aspect of this. And as Manjit uh, mentioned, I had uh, you know decades of experience in uh, Hong Kong media, international media in Hong Kong. And in, um, 2018, in the first half of 2018, I was invited to join the board of directors of Next Digital. Um, I, I, I knew this could eventually cause some, some issues with my then employer, the Asia Business Council, because it was founded by um, uh, some Hong Kong business people, among others. And although it had a, has a very regional focus, uh, you know, there are Hong Kong business people who don't, didn't like the, the pro-democracy aspect of, of Apple Daily, the flagship newspaper of Next Digital. But um, I've always been interested in media. As uh, Manjeet said, I was the publisher uh, as well as the editor-in-chief of The Standard. So I have an interest in the business side as well. And um, Next Digital, like many media organizations, needed to make the transition from print to digital. And that's what we were really focused on. I wasn't involved in the editorial operations. I was an independent, non-executive director, not involved in daily operations, but you know, really interested and fascinated by this shift to a digital model, which we were executing um, 
very, very effectively. We had about 600,000 subscribers in a city of seven and a half million people at the uh, time when the police uh, came in for the second time to Next Digital's or to Apple Daily's newsroom. We had um, 550 armed police uh, come in and, and treat a newsroom like a crime scene. This is a newsroom where was, they were doing the same thing in that in that mid June day, just you know nine nine months ago, eight months ago, uh, that they'd been doing for twenty six years, just putting out a newspaper that uh, was a mix of gossip and celebrity kind of uh, news and and hard business, uh, pretty free market oriented business, and really aggressive pro democracy um, uh, news coverage and politics and commentary and. It seemed that the, uh, the Chinese uh, leadership in Beijing just couldn't take this challenge to, to its authority. Uh, and um, kind of long, it's a long story. We can talk about it more. But the net result is seven of my colleagues are in jail right now as we speak. And they've been there uh, in most cases since, since last June, July. Uh, in the case of Jimmy Lai, who's the founder and majority shareholder of Next Digital, uh, he's been in jail since, uh, for the most part, few days out on under house arrest uh, at Christmas a year ago, but he's been in jail since December 3rd, 2020. So, you know, about 15 months. Um, Jimmy is uh, 74 years old, uh, a practicing, very devout Roman Catholic, a diabetic. Um, and he's a man who's always preached nonviolence, but he's in uh, maximum security prison. Uh, whenever he's taken out, uh, he's, he's manacled, put in 30, 35 pounds of chains just to show that the Chinese have the power. And uh, so I went in the, um, in the course of writing this book, I went from, uh, I, I got a PhD in Hong Kong history a few years ago, and I, I, I wanted to try to show the, the reality of uh, the, the quest for democracy and freedom in Hong Kong that had been going on for, for decades. Uh, and, but I was an outsider. Uh, obviously I'm, I'm not Chinese. Um, but uh, I thought I had something to say. And in the course of writing this, I was caught up in this horrific uh, series of events. I mean, of course, I'm fine. Um, I continue to be uh, the subject, along with other directors of investigations by the Hong Kong government, which seems determined to prove that the closure of Apple Daily, uh, which occurred after the police came in, they took away uh, our senior staff, including the chief executive officer, the editor in chief, number of journalists, as I said, seven are in jail. And they froze our bank accounts, making it impossible for us to pay our staff, forcing us to shut down. But they seem to uh, want to prove that free pre the free press is alive and well in Hong Kong. And the only reason Apple closed is because lousy directors uh, just ran the company into the ground. So I thought it was a chance to try to set the record straight to the extent I could. So what started out as a kind of uh, more cerebral history project became uh, a much more intimate and personal and even passionate uh, project, so. Yes, Mark, your passion shines through very strongly, I have to say, as you, as you read the book. I was wondering if we could um, discuss a little bit of the history, because that's an interesting aspect of the book that you're so forensic back and really charting um, much of the um, democratic development in Hong Kong but also the political and legal steps that have led to today. So one of the points you make very strongly in the book is that the Hong Kong basic law actually was designed to provide a path to universal suffrage in Hong Kong. So in the run up to the handover um, by the British in 1997, um, the government, the business elite, and um, in fact, pro Beijing, representatives promised that universal suffrage would come in 2007. You know, to recall Deng Xiaoping's comments, he talked about Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong in the future. So what changed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and did, I guess the other part of it is, did anything change or did was China always uh, determined to control um, Hong Kong? Um, let, let me, uh, if if you'll indulge me, go back a little bit in history. I, I mentioned the quirk of the long colonial twilight where Hong Kong remained as a colony decades after other countries got their independence. Um, but because China 
always regarded uh, Hong Kong as as uh, as part of China that was taken from it during the the so-called unequal tr treaties of the 19th century as a result of the the opium wars uh, first in 1839 to 1843 and then in uh, the second opium war of the late 1850s you know quite quite understandably um, China thought that uh, Hong Kong should come back to it and was prepared to wait until the end of uh, a 99 year lease on a third part of Hong Kong. So Hong Kong was taken in three different steps by the British. Um, and that 99 year lease um, expired in 1997 on June 30th. So the Chinese knew if they just waited that Hong Kong would fall into their lap. Uh, however, what they perhaps hadn't counted on is during that time, Hong Kong developed, its people developed a taste for freedom, for good governance, uh, for rule of law all those things that um, you know, many of us in open societies take for granted. So when Margaret Thatcher went to, um, to meet Deng Xiaoping in 1982, um, Deng and Deng said, we're taking it back. And she said, you don't understand it. You can't run it. We'll give you sovereignty. We want to keep administering. And he said, no way. We think we can run it. We think we understand it. But if we mess it up, so what? I mean, basically politics rules. And interesting because... Uh, that is the lesson I think that perhaps we didn't pay enough uh, attention to at the time. And I think the, the British tried to leave honorably. They had a joint declaration with the Chinese um, in 1984, followed, as you said, Penny, by the basic law, which was a kind of mini constitution that it was wonderful on paper. I mean, it guaranteed a path towards universal suffrage. Crucially, it did not specify 2007. It said 10 years, it said it could happen as early as 10 years after the handover, but everybody in the run up to the handover, all the pro-Beijing people, the business people, they all said, we'll have universal suffrage in 2007. So what happened? I think what happened is that Beijing made a major miscalculation in thinking that Hong Kong people would welcome the return to the so-called motherland, that as Chinese, they would welcome the resumption of sovereignty by the, the, uh, the Chinese government. Of course, the Chinese communist government, the People's Republic of China, didn't exist when, when um, the British took, uh, took Hong Kong. It didn't exist um, uh, when, when World War II ended and, and there were moves to, um, at that point, actually, it was very much touch and go as to whether or not China under Chiang Kai-shek would take Hong Kong back. And uh, um, again, it could have gone either way. I mean, Hong Kong could have gone back to China in the 40s, but it had this, this weird long colonial twilight and um, I think the, the Chinese just fundamentally didn't understand Hong Kong people. And I think they thought universal suffrage was fine as long as their candidates would win. And they set up grassroots political parties, which did a lot of good work and did have uh, some support among Hong Kong people. But ultimately, Hong Kong people kept rebelling every time China tied, tried to tighten the, the grip. It tried in 2003 with some abortive national security legislation that brought a half a million people out in the streets. Think of it, 500,000 people in a city of seven and a half million. And that city of seven and a half million is not as it would in the US drawing a lot of protesters from, from other regions or provinces or states. It's 500,000 out of seven and a half million. By the time we get to 2019, we have a million, two million people out in the streets. So in any open society, the government would negotiate with, uh, with the people. And in, in, um, in China and in Hong Kong, uh, negotiation wasn't on the table. We can be thankful they didn't send the tanks in, but they, you know, they, sent, they, they waged war not with tanks, but through the legal system and through this national security law. Actually, I was going to ask you about the national security law, which was passed in 2020. Many people have sort of seen the passage of the national security law, sort of a watershed, really, in China's ability to put down that ongoing rebellion and really comprehensively begin to take control of Hong Kong. Would you like to tell us a little bit about the national security law? Sure. Um so that came, again, 2019 was a really a kind of uprise, and it was the most sustained resistance uh, that the People's Republic of China had seen since it was founded in 1949. I mean, even the, the pro-democracy demonstrations of 1989 pale in comparison to this, you know, months, uh, almost six months of, you know, really large-scale demonstrations. Um, 
And uh, I think China, it, well, I should say, in, it, it culminated with some elections for low level kind of ward officials called district councillors. And Beijing kept thinking there was this, this hidden uh, silent majority of pro-Beijing people. Well, there was a silent majority, but it was anti-Beijing and the pro-democracy people, despite uh, some you know, quite regrettable violence on the part of the demonstrators, the pro-democracy people just swept those elections in a very high record turnout, over 70% of registered voters uh, voted. And I think Beijing was like, enough is enough. We're not going to let democracy come in because we think, you know, we let we let the door open a little bit in Hong Kong. And I mean, who knows what could happen in the mainland? I mean, it seems preposterous to me, but that's how they think. And rather than seeing that democracy and universal suffrage and more openness and freedom uh, would be you know, wonderful for Hong Kong's continued development, but it would also be a, a you know, kind of balance on, on Hong Kong, um, a check and balance, uh, and would help actually stabilize Hong Kong. They decided the way to stabilize Hong Kong was to smash it. And um, you say that the national security law was passed, but it actually wasn't passed by anybody in Hong Kong. It was passed by uh, part of the, the parliament, so-called parliament up in Beijing, the National People's Congress, its standing committee. So it was really promulgated. It was imposed on Hong Kong. And in fact, the chief executive of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, apparently didn't even see the bill until the same day that it was, it was uh, put into effect on June 30th. Um, 2020. Um, and um, so what does this law mean? It sort of is a version of kind of Alice in Wonderland meets George Orwell and Franz Kafka. It means whatever they want it to mean. Um, we have, uh, uh, well, technically it outlaws, um, you know, pretty scary things like secession, subversion, collusion with foreign forces. I mean, all countries have national security laws. I mean, nobody questions that. Um, but uh, the way that it's been implemented, uh, it could, for example, uh, affect our conversation here today. I mean, the Chinese say that anyone, anywhere who contravenes it can, can be subject to, to their penalties. And their penalties effectively are they keep you in prison as long as they feel like it uh, without bail uh, and without trial necessarily. My colleagues at Apple Daily Jimmy Lai has been convicted of some minor civil disobedience offenses. The other six people who are being held are being held without bail. Trial dates keep getting pushed around. I mean, so, you know, the basic law says you should be presumed innocent until you've been convicted, it says you have the right to bail, habeas corpus type provisions where, you know, the state can't just hold you because it feels like it. All of this has been disregarded in the case of the, the national security law. And, you know, China says that it's, you know, it's upholding the law. It's upholding the basic law. The joint declaration with the, with the British doesn't matter. But, you know, the fact is they're hauling people off to jail and they're holding them as long as they want. There's one woman who was a, a involved with the production of a children's book. She was a, a speech therapist. And the book was a parable about sheep and wolves. And I guess it was some kind of uh, parable about uh, China's rule over, over Hong Kong, but she's sitting in jail under national security law charges, hasn't been convicted, can't get bail, but they didn't like her book. I mean, we have cases, you know, of like 17 year old uh, girl who's being held under these, these charges. So, I mean, it means if we don't like you, we throw you in jail. That's um, quite concerning. Are there instances where we've seen the law being applied beyond Hong Kong? Because you do actually make the point that the way it's been written is that the Chinese, as you've just said, see it as universally applicable and global in scope. Yeah. Um, they have threatened, uh, uh, Hong Kong officials have threatened uh, Hong Kong dissidents who've, who are in exile with, with the law. Um, it's, you know, because there's so little transparency. Um, uh, you, you don't actually know if they have a warrant out for you or not. And it's, uh, well, let me just take a, an example how they shut down Apple Daily. Uh, we got a letter from um, actually three different letters from uh, the then Secretary for Security, who's now been promoted. Uh, he's now the number two official in Hong Kong. And he said he was either a lot of legal stuff in there, but the, the heart of it was he said that he had, quote, reason to believe, end quote, three words, reason to believe that uh, the three companies involved had uh, violated the national security law. No evidence, nothing, just reason to believe. So for that, he froze our bank accounts, told bankers that if they had anything to do, if they touched those accounts, 
they could be liable to seven years in prison. Uh, we were then told by our counsel that if we used other accounts to try to pay our employees or to make good on literally the electricity bill, the phone bill, that those accounts would be contaminated and then frozen. So it's all quote unquote legal. It's what China engages in in lawfare. They use the appearance of a legal system to uh, achieve predetermined political ends. It's an interesting descriptor, lawfare. I think that's the first time I've heard that. <laughs> It's not my phrase, so I can't take credit for it, but I think it sums it up. And, and look, it's, it's very sophisticated. It definitely beats sending tanks in and, and you know, running over people and killing them in the streets. But uh, it, it does kill open political discussion. It does kill a free society. So given the passage of the law, in inverted commas, as you pointed out, it wasn't passed in Hong Kong, it was promulgated by the MPC. Um, I guess, why have we seen this sort of deep change, really, in China's response to Hong Kong? And, you know, why now? What has really changed beyond the, the sort of ongoing protests that you noted have gone back through history? It's not as though, it's, you know, and the scale might have increased, but it's not as though there hasn't always been a degree of resistance. So, yeah. I, so I guess this comes back to the question I, I still don't have an answer for. Were the Chinese always going to do this or did was there something peculiar? I, I think there's contingency in history. I think things could have gone in different directions. Uh, I think there were very many uh, well-meaning people that China of the 1980s and even 1990s was a lot more open than it is now. One big thing that's changed, of course, is the leader of China. Um, I think everybody on this uh, this uh, Zoom uh, event knows that uh, Xi Jinping is the, is the most powerful leader, at least since Mao, in China, and he has uh, he has an agenda to uh, rejuvenate China, have it take its what he regards as its rightful place in the world. Um, and uh, part of that, his, his way of doing that is not through particularly um, uh, attractive soft power, it's through hammering down resistance. And um, uh, I, 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 you know, if, if Hong Kong people hadn't resisted, maybe it would have been different. But I, I think that people who, who blame protesters for having gone too far, or who say that Jimmy Lai was a troublemaker, or you know, the Chinese have called him a black hand. I mean, I think those people miss the point. I mean, that's like blaming the person who gets robbed for you know walking down a street that he shouldn't have walked down. I mean, you got to blame the robber. And in this case, I think it's very clear that the hard line comes right from the top, right from the center of power, and that's Xi Jinping and the people around him in Zhongnanhai. The people that she has sent down to Hong Kong, and he has taken a personal interest in Hong Kong. He ran one of the so-called leading groups that sets Hong Kong policy. I mean, Xi Jinping himself did. Um, you know, the two people he sent down at the er, to run Hong Kong in early 2020, right after that election and that summer of democracy, but right before the national security law, had a background. Uh, one of them was famous for breaking up Christian churches in the province of Zhejiang. I mean, he literally was a church breaker. And the other was a hard anti-corruption uh, graft fighter who had been in the Coleridge province of Shanxi, which is, um, you know, was a hotbed of corruption. More recently, the new commander of the People's Liberation Army uh, unit in Hong Kong uh, has a background at running Xinjiang commando forces, running forces, you know, hunting down, so, you know, and killing, um, so-called separatists and terrorists. So you send people like that to Hong Kong, uh, you know, and you know, you're going to, it's like you give a guy a hammer and, and what's he going to do? He's going to beat down the nail. I mean, that's what they know how to do. That's what they're trained to do. They see conspiracies and plots uh, everywhere. They don't see free people who just want to be left alone and not have to worry at the, about the midnight knock at the door. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm going to pick up on... Um on a point that you make strongly in the book, which is, you know, your view that Hong Kong is where the Chinese Communist Party is sort of perfecting its playbook. You've just mentioned Xinjiang, for example, but perfecting the playbook for um, smothering and trying to control free and open societies. So given what we've seen unfolding in the last two years, do you think that democracies like the UK, the US, India, Canada, Australia, 
should have taken stronger measures or reacted differently to events in Hong Kong? Well, I mean, it, it, it's a great question. Um, I, I, I spent most of my adult life uh, implicitly working for engagement. I think it was good to try to engage China. I was, uh, you know, Manjit and I were working together when uh, China got into the WTO. I worked on a book uh, with the then incoming director general um, of the WTO, Super Chai Panich Park. I mean, you know, really um, extolling China's uh, entry to the WTO for the for the boost it would give to reform within China. So um, I, I think we were we were right to, to work with China. Um, if there had been a different leader than Xi Jinping, maybe things would have worked out differently. Um, I, you know, of course, you know, personally, I'd like to see uh, stronger sanctions against China, uh, against China if, re with regard to Hong Kong and against the enablers in Hong Kong, judges, officials, uh, other people who might not be in government who are, you know, really perpetrating human rights abuses. Um, there obviously is a limit to you know, how much we can, you know, quote unquote, hurt China. I mean, in a macroeconomic sense, you know, China is a really, really big economy, $18 trillion. Last time I looked, it's probably larger now. Um, we've seen how difficult it is to impose sanctions on a much smaller country, Russia. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good question. I think it's evolving. I can tell you from my work with the Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong, which is focused uh, on, on watch the U.S. and the U.K., that there's certainly an appetite among legislators uh, and among parts of government for much tougher actions towards China. But I think we have to look at Hong Kong within the context of uh, a bigger shift that's taking place vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. And I think there's a real hardening of attitudes um, in the last few years, let's say the last five years, um, with regards to, um, to to China on the part of, of, of the West and a part of open society. So yes, I would have liked to have seen tougher sanctions, but uh, I think it's like turning an aircraft carrier. I mean, these things take time. And I think I think the aircraft carrier is starting to turn. And uh, I think we'll see that, uh, that an acceleration of that movement. Thank you, Mark. Um, there's a question from Tanaguchi san, which touches on something I was really keen to ask you about. You know, Hong Kong has been an economic powerhouse, including for China. And, you know, it's incredibly strong institutions, it's open economy, it's functioning as kind of a window on the world for Beijing has been incredibly valuable. And, um, been, those things have been long perceived, we had thought, as an asset by the Chinese government. But quite frankly, um, it's interesting, many expats uh, in Hong Kong say, well, because of all of this, China is never going to kill the golden goose. That's you know, what my banker friends say. They say, you know, it's just too valuable. So the Chinese are going to make sure that they don't go too far um, in punishing Hong Kong and that they do preserve those institutions that they see as valuable. For example, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority being one. Um, what's your view on how far you might see a limit on political freedom turning into a limit on economic freedom or undermining those institutions and the economic freedoms that have made Hong Kong a powerhouse? Yeah, I, th I think that's a really, you know, a multi-billion dollar question. Um, th let me just give you the glib answer, which is to paraphrase Chris Patton, who was the last governor of Hong Kong. Uh, he said hi people wouldn't say that if history weren't littered with dead geese. And uh, <laughs> people, people, people kill geese sometimes without meaning to. And uh, I think... Um, uh, I don't think that uh, China, or at least a couple of years ago, I don't think that China, I think China really wanted to keep Hong Kong as an international financial center. I actually think a combination of politics and the pandemic, it's sort of giving up on, on Hong Kong as an international financial center. And I go back to, you know, again, paraphrasing what Deng Xiaoping told Thatcher back in September 1982. It's like, yeah, we think we can do it. And if we can't, well, so what? Um, politics is in our control is more important. And uh, I think that's that's still the message. Um, 
Beijing does regard Hong Kong as an economic city, as a business city. It sort of fits it into a, a kind of Marxist analysis that uh, I think has really privileged business uh, since the handover in a way that has been detrimental to development of Hong Kong society. But of course, Hong Kong's not alone in having, you know, gap between the, the haves and the have nots and a worsening one. But um, uh, I, I think it's it's very hard to dislodge international financial centers. I mean, Hong Kong is up there with London and New York as a global financial center. And once you have the networks and the people and the institutions, things like the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the um, uh, Securities and Futures Commission, uh, and you know all your banker friends there, it's really, really hard to to get that to move somewhere else or to destroy it. And I think China understands that. It also knows that the way to uh, reach policymakers in Washington and London is through Wall Street, through the financial community. They, they have inordinate political power. All that said, uh, Hong Kong is much, much less important to, um, to China than it was at the time of the handover. At that time, if I remember correctly, it's, it was uh, Hong Kong's GDP was about 18% of China's. Now it's 3% and shrinking. Um, in a macroeconomic sense, the, the, the flows that come through Hong Kong really don't matter. Now, I do think Hong Kong is useful for technology and other transfer. But um, I'm actually much less uh, optimistic about Hong Kong's ability to remain as, a, as an open business center than I was uh, even a couple of years ago. Uh, because I think that what's happened with the pandemic has actually been more serious in some ways in driving people out and driving your banker friends out uh, than, than the politics are. I mean, business can, you know, let's be realistic, business can uh, live with pretty tough politics as long as it feels that you know, there's some certainty about its ability and some rules of the game. But the pandemics we just had a couple of days ago, they, the government out of the blue announced that the school holiday, the summer holiday would be brought forward two months. And so from next week, schools are shut for two months. Now, that kind of stuff really, really makes it hard for, for families and parents with, with children, whether they're Chinese or expats. The expats can leave more e easily. So, um, you know, the, the kind of lockdown, I mean, Beijing has really lost its patience with Hong Kong's ability to manage the pandemic. And just, I think it was last week, big story in Dagong Bao, which is a communist owned and con controlled, obviously, newspaper in Hong Kong, uh, a message from Xi Jinping to Carrie Lam, the chief executive, telling her and her government they had better shape up, you know, drop the colonial mindset and, you know, beat this pandemic. Well, Xi Jinping, quite frankly, has other ways of reaching Carrie Lam other than, you know, using the, the press. I mean, they're sending a message to Hong Kong. You guys had better get with our program and uh, or else, you know, we're going to take over. And they already have hundreds of people right across the border in Shenzhen, basically managing the anti-pandemic effort. They're going to test every Hong Konger. They're going to experiment with the kind of, uh, you know, complete lockdowns that we saw in Wuhan, but probably on a smaller district basis initially. Um, you know, Beijing is really losing patience with Hong Kong. And this is, this is an important political year for Xi Jinping. And he's, you know, crowed about how the China's success in in beating the pandemic proves the superiority of the Chinese model. Well, you know, if it turns out it wasn't so uh, superior and wasn't so successful, puts him in a bad position at a year when it, he's trying to consolidate his power and get that kind of magical third, third term. Interesting, Mark, thank you. I think you also make the point very persuasively in your book that um, at the same time as um, Quite frankly, Beijing has been working on lessening that importance of Hong Kong as a driver of the economy of um, southern China for some time. And the recent Greater Bay Area Initiative um, and the development of the Pearl River Delta has been part of that long-term strategy, really, to kind of shift the economic gravity away from Hong Kong over time. It's a really interesting dynamic situation, I think. And your point is very well made about the impact of the pandemic, quite frankly, rather than just tough politics in driving international business from Hong Kong increasingly. We have several questions um, that touch on essentially the same point. Um, and it's quite a tough question, but people are interested in your view, Mark, on whether what has happened with Hong Kong actually is a template for what we might see in terms of an approach from 
Beijing to Taiwan? Yeah, I mean, abs, that's an easy, it's not a tough question. The answer is yes. And uh, they, um, you know, Chinese officials have made it clear that the national security law is something that they would, uh, you know, plan to apply to, uh, in some version of Taiwan. Interestingly, the so-called one country, two systems, which is, you know, when Hong Kong went back and Macau went back two years later, that um, you, there, everybody was part of China, but you had the Hong Kong system, as, as you said, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong. And, um, you know, Hong Kong still has its own currency, its own government, its own tax system. I mean, a lot of the trappings of a sovereign state. And originally, the idea was developed for Taiwan. It was then, you know, kind of, you know, rolled out in a test uh, test bed, I guess, for was was Hong Kong. Well, Taiwan has seen how this has gone. They want nothing to do with it. So it's interesting that Beijing is switching from one country, two systems, as it tries to woo Taiwan to national security law. We're coming, whether you like it or not. So it's today Hong Kong, tomorrow Taiwan. I guess then the rest of the world. And uh, yeah, I think Taiwan has a lot of reason to be nervous. I mean, Beijing has been increasingly aggressive in with its military. I mean, you know this in India, but I mean around the uh, around the region. But above all, with Taiwan, where they've been flying not quite nonstop, they've been flying you know very intimidating military missions into. Um, Taiwan's air identification zone. I mean, not technically into Taiwan airspace, but, you know, really probing the defenses, you know, exhausting, trying to exhaust the Taiwanese who have to keep scrambling fighter jets to go up and meet them. So, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a very, very tense time uh, for, for Taiwan and for the region and for the world, of course. So that's obviously in light of developments today with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we also have a number of our participants asking, are there any implications of what's happening with the Ukraine situation for what we might see with regard to um, Chinese action on Taiwan? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. We're all wondering that. I mean, clearly, uh, people in Beijing are watching to see how the Biden administration and how other, you know, members of the Quad, members of NATO, how people react to, you know, one of the most naked, you know, provocations, you know, that we've seen in, in decades. I mean, a, a major country invading a small neighbor. I mean, this is not the kind of thing we were expecting for the 21st century, um, but here we are. And I think if, uh, I mean, two two obvious points to make. If if the U.S. Uh, sorry, if if the rest of the world just accepts this as they accepted Hitler's annexation of Austria and later Czechoslovakia, I think China has a pretty clear message and uh, takes away a pretty clear lesson. And I should say, I mean, my contention for some time is that the Chinese think that you know, just as they did it in Hong Kong and they got away with it and. They militarized the South China Sea, despite promises by Xi Jinping to Obama that it wouldn't happen. They got away with it, um, as you know, we could go on and on about uh, pretty aggressive actions that, that China has taken and hasn't paid a price. And I think th that Ukraine will be a very, very interesting you know, lesson for them, as I say, see how the world reacts. If you can just gobble up a neighboring country and really by all... <laughs> By all measures, except for the political uh, response from Beijing, I mean, Taiwan is an independent country. And if you can just take it over because you've decided that that was part of your you know, historical empire and that the people there are Chinese and that all Chinese should be part of one nation. Well, you know, we're into a different world. I mean, I think they would like an Anschluss kind of settlement for Taiwan where they don't have to send in the tanks because that does get messy. Thank you. Um, for a very candid view on that. I think it's very much top of mind for, for many people as we're watching events in Ukraine. What really, what kind of precedent is that going to set elsewhere? And whether or not it's going to encourage other countries um, to think differently about you know, low cost or no cost options, quite frankly, for extending their reach. We actually have a few interesting questions on that. I'm a bit mindful of time. So I was actually going to um, take one of the questions from our participants and then um, finish with a question that I think is really important for all of us um, about your view of the future. 
So the question that I wanted to, to move to, and it picks up a little bit on the historical point is, you know, is this Britain's fault that we are where we are today? I mean, quite frankly, we've talked about the colonial period. There might have been weaknesses in the various agreements and laws and understandings that were put in place pre-transition um, and to guide the future of Hong Kong. Um, is this on them? That's interesting. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that in quite that way before. Um, I, I don't think so. Um, I think the British left a legacy that they can be proud of. And I say this as a country which, you know, obviously fought and, and uh, won a war against the, the British um, uh, a long time ago, of course. Um, no, I think that I think the British try, tried their best. I do think that the British colonial colonial administrators um, I mean, they're well-meaning people, but they they were not real pro-democracy advocates, and they let themselves be um, intimidated by a combination of local business community, both uh, expatriate, especially British, of course, and Chinese. And the Chinese business community has always um, been after its own interests and not after the interests of the majority of Hong Kong people. And that's been true from the 19th century on just case after case. Um, uh, I, I I do think that um, belatedly the British uh, tried their best, but it was way too late. I mean, Chris Patton, I think, was you know a, a, a sea change um, because it was the first time that a, a retail politician uh, was appointed. Now Patton was appointed in 1992 by John Major, so it was it was pretty late in the going. I think it if back in the early 1980s, uh, you know, at the time of the Sino-British negotiations, Hong Kong people had been for example, radical notion included in the negotiations, that would have been nice. I mean, Hong Kong people were completely excluded as their fate and their future was being decided. I mean, even the most elite Hong Kongers were not brought into this. And we're sort of in the same situation now, say with the national security law, even the elite Hong Kongers are not brought into decisions that are made about, about their fate. So I, I, it's, I also think that the British uh, failed abysmally in um, developing political leaders. They developed great administrators. I mean, the, the cadre of administrative officers is, you know, really a, among the best, or was among the best in the world. Carrie Lam, the current chief executive, was among the best and the brightest of her, her you know, cohort. And she's proven to be just a, a horrible political leader. The other uh, administrative officer who was the chief executive, uh, Donald Jung, again, brilliant um, administrative officer, horrible political leader. So the British did not use those last couple of decades to develop political leaders and to develop, uh, I, I guess, democracy more broadly. So we can blame them to some extent, but uh, ultimately, uh, I mean, many, many sovereign nations have absorbed former colonies uh, and some of them have done it better and some of them have done worse. And I think China has done a really, really bad job with Hong Kong. So ultimately, you have to blame the Chinese Communist Party. I think if, if let's say, uh, Chiang Kai-shek had prevailed and, and we saw what we see in Taiwan today was, was the reality in, in the mainland, mainland China today, we'd, we'd, have complete, we'd have no problem with Hong Kong. I think that's a really interesting perspective. And I, I want to give um, the questioner their due. It was one of the Gateway House interns who posed that Thank you. Question. Good question. Great question. Um, what I'd like to do is just shift a little bit. And I was really interested that um, despite everything, you maintain a sense of optimism about um, the future and about the ability of countries to, to really navigate this difficult period with a rising China. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about where your source of optimism comes from? and what you see might happen in the next two to three years? Well, I don't think I'm optimistic necessarily in the next two to three years. I'm, I'm optimistic because I think that the lesson of tyrannies is they don't last forever. I mean, democracies don't last forever either, but I think there's such a, a quest for, for freedom that I've seen among the Hong Kong people. Now, of course, many of them are in exile at you know, this large diaspora. Um, and I, th I think that we'll, we'll see people fighting not, not to return Hong Kong to some, you know, idyllic, you know, 
pre-1997 day. I mean, that, you know, we've moved on. But I think that Hong Kong people have developed a sense of themselves um, uh, and a, a sense of their community, their city, um, that uh, you know, is extraordinary and has actually has been forged under the crucible of, of you know, this, this kind of an, anvil that's been wielded by Beijing. So uh, I've been just really impressed by the work that I'm seeing, that I see being done by, by Hong Kongers. I look at the people in jail, people like Jimmy Lai that are, you know, the Chinese are doing everything they can to break because if you, the, the, the funny thing and the fragility of a place that's as strong as China is, you can't have even one Jimmy Lai. You can't have one person who tells the truth about, about you know, you know, what really, what an evil place this is and the way that it's trying to destroy the human spirit. And I just ultimately believe that people's quest for justice and truth um, and freedom prevails because that's what, that's what people want. That's who we are as humans. I don't think in the short term, looking at China, that there's going to be some really quick uh, change. But you know, as we've seen, whether it's the Ukraine today or the pandemic of the last couple of years, we really can't predict uh, events. I mean, the pandemic came close in its early days to, well, it, it was for a time looking like an existential threat to the Chinese government, to the, to the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, they overcame that, but, you know, are they going to be able to overcome every disease, every challenge they face? I mean, they face massive environmental challenges. I don't think that's going to mean that there's democracy in China tomorrow. We may end up with something worse uh, when tomorrow. I mean, if if there's a change, but um, you know, the Chinese Communist Party has been in in power for seventy plus years, and um, it's not going to last forever. So we just we just we keep we keep fighting on for what we know is right. And I guess I above all wake up every morning thinking of my seven colleagues from Apple Daily who are in jail, right? Just because. They were doing their jobs and running a newspaper and doing the same thing that they've been doing in Apple Daily for 26 years. And there's scores of other people. There are 10,000 people in Hong Kong, 10,000 plus, who were arrested on political charges in, in 2019 and 2020. And, you know, I think a lot of us are, are working to, to ensure, if not justice for those people, that, you know, they'll be able to, you know, enjoy, you know, lives that, uh, you know, allow them. In most places, the people that are in jail in most countries would be regarded as, you know, good citizens, civically engaged, caring about their communities. I mean, it's it's just uh, it's just preposterous that Hong Kong has come to this where we can even talk about political prisoners. Look, thank you very much for that. And I think it's actually really interesting to sort of end with that dual point. One, you know, over time, it's very hard to predict what will happen, but that sense of resilience in the human spirit is something that you clearly um, feel very strongly about. And um, let me say, um, it's an amazing contribution that you've made to the sort of knowledge and level of understanding of what's happening in Hong Kong through your book. And of course, to the prospects for justice for your seven colleagues and those other individuals whose stories you've told in such a compelling way in the book. So. Um, I think on behalf of all of us this evening, um, I think this has been a really interesting conversation and I'm personally enormously grateful that you've been willing to be so candid and insightful in answering all of our questions and sharing with us some of the great insights from your book. Um, for those who haven't read it, let me thoroughly recommend it. And with that, let me hand back to Manjit to form my close. Thank you. Thank you, Penny and uh, Mark. I, I, we couldn't have had a better interlocutor or a better subject. Uh, just the subject of the book and the, and the knowledgeable author. So thank you very much, Mark. I hope we'll have a chance to, uh, to bring you back again to talk about this uh, issue because I think this is only the beginning. We are going to see, uh, just now, I mean, it's a strange day to have this meeting, given that everybody is watching what's going on in Europe, but people shouldn't forget uh, what is going to happen on our side of the world. And so the early warning bell has been rung and today is it. So, um, so thank you very much. We look forward to having you back. Uh, this is also being watched on YouTube by, by uh, lots of other people. And so, 
please look look for it again on Twitter and Instagram and all our other uh, channels. And look forward to having you back. Wishing you all the very best, Mark. And thank you, Penny. You were wonderful. Really yeah, thank you, Manjeet. Uh, thank you, Penny. And thank you, all of at Gateway House uh, for reviewing my book, for the questions, uh, and for all the, all the support you've given. So um, let's stay in touch. And thanks again. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank Apologies for not getting to all the questions next time. <laughs> good question. You have too many good questions. Bye. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. This was a fascinating one hour. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark.